I am willing to bet most drivers don't even think about this, but did you know the wheels on your car travel at different speeds whenever you turn? This is because given a turn, your outer tire seems to travel a further distance than your inner tire. The bigger the radius, the further the travel. How is this a problem, you may ask? Welcome to part 4 of our How A Car Works series. We've tackled the basics of how an engine works, explained what a clutch is, and why we need to have a transmission. If you haven't watched our previous videos yet, I suggest that you do since you might get a little bit lost watching this video without watching our old ones. So after the transmission, we can now split the power to two tires. But wait, we run into a problem. As mentioned earlier, when we turn, the outside tires are traveling at a different speed than the inside tires. So if you think about it, how do you connect an engine that's traveling at a constant RPM to two tires that are spinning at different speeds? Okay, what if we just connect it to one wheel then? That should solve our problems, right? Well, yeah, but it's kinda not a good option also. For one, when you accelerate, the car will pull to one side since power is not applied symmetrically. And if you're unlucky and that tire gets stuck on a slippery surface, you won't get any traction. You're stuck. Okay, so transmitting power to just one tire can't be. What if now we just force it and connect it to the two tires regardless? Well, it does some weird stuff too. Well, first of all, at low speeds when we're forcing it to turn, we're actually dragging one tire all the time when turning. This will increase tire wear and add unnecessary stress to the drivetrain since we're forcing it. And at higher speeds, the car seems to not want to turn also. Since the left and the right tires are forced to go at the same speed, the rear axle is actually resisting rotation. The car will just tend to plow forward. So how do we fix this conundrum? Actually, humans have actually figured this out as early as 100 BC. Yes, you heard me right. 100 BC. So even before the car was invented, this thing was already a problem apparently since forever. And the earliest we've seen this contraption and automotive application was actually in steam-powered wagons. It is called the differential. And it's a quirky little thing. But before we move on, hi, I'm Emi Kurama by the way, your resident automotive VTuber. If you're liking the video you're watching so far, don't forget to give it a like. It'll really help with our algorithm. And we'll be doing a lot more car content in the future, so subscribe if you want to see more. You can also leave a comment down below on what topics you want to see in the future, since after this video, we're now free to go to more advanced topics. I also stream playing games by the way on our dedicated YouTube streaming channel and on Twitch. Also, if you want to support this channel so I can do more videos, or if you found some of my content mind-blowing for some reason, you can leave me a tip on Ko-Fi or on Streamer Elements. You can also use our product code EMIKURAMA to get 10% off your gamer shop's purchase if you're buying some. Again, all of those links are down below. Now back to the differential. This mechanism allows the left and the right tires to move at different speeds while being powered by the engine. Like a, like a speed differential mechanism. Wow, speed differential mechanism. Let's take a closer look. When moving forward, the differential mechanism doesn't even move. It just rotates with the axle when going straight. But as you can see, if we apply brakes on the right side tire, the power is still free to transmit to the left. Power goes through like this. Okay, I'll give you guys a minute to like see how it actually works because yeah, it, it is kind of complicated, kind of kind of hurts your brain cells a bit. Now thanks to this, we can power both tires and turn the car without binding. The left and the right tire are free to go at their own speeds but remain powered at the same time. It's like magic, but it's actually just science. Really clever science. Now, I, I know, I know, it, it, look, it looks complicated, right? So let's have a series of examples to further understand how the mechanism works. Here is how having a differential powering two tires is significantly better than having only one wheel drive. Now, to simplify things, we're not going to use proper scientific terms because I'm actually very confused with the proper scientific terms also because I'm not an engineer by the way I'm just kind of understanding all of this intuitively also and the units we'll be using we'll just call it torques like, like plural torques it'll be enough to get the point across at least because differentiating torque from horsepower is its own other can of worms so, so to the engineers out there listening to this we're, we're simplifying it okay we're simplifying it alright so let's say your car is going uphill and it needs to transmit 
50 torque units to the ground in order for it to move forward. Because of course you're going uphill, right? So you need to have enough traction in order to push the car up. So let's say that tires on this car on a dry road has enough traction to transfer 50 torques to the ground. So even let's say we're only one wheel drive, when we send 50 torques through the axle to the tire, we have enough tire grip to transmit 50 torques to the ground so the car will have enough traction and move forward. But what if that singular tire is on grass? And let's say that drops the grip capacity of the tire to 30 torques. Now we're in trouble. It only has enough traction to apply 30 torques to the ground. The car won't move, the tires will just continue to spin. And we're stuck. Step bro help. Alright, now let's install our differential mechanism and power two tires instead of one. So here's the thing with differentials. The tire with more grip can receive as much torque as the capacity of the less grippy tire. I, I, I know, that sounded a lot like gibberish. So, so, so what does that mean? Now going back to our example, our right tire will still be spinning, but technically, it's still transmitting 30 torques to the ground. That means the right axle is experiencing 30 torques of resistance, and that resistance will bind the differential and make the differential send 30 torques to the left wheel. So even if one tire is spinning, as long as there's a resistance to it, that's enough for it to bind the differential to send power to the other tire. So in total, our system can now transmit 60 torques to the ground. And that is more than the 50 torques requirement to move forward. So you're no longer stuck. Whoa, whoa, step bro, chill, chill, chill. We, we, we don't need you this time. Congratulations, we can now transmit power to two tires and have them travel at different speeds. You now know how a differential works. And I'll see you in the next- Wait, 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 wait. No, no, we're actually not ending the video just yet. Not until I leave a cliffhanger. Now this simplest form of differential is actually good enough for your daily commute and for most scenarios, but in some cases, it, it actually has a weakness. Going back to our example earlier, if one tire has little to no traction, there's actually not enough resistance in the axle to make the differential transmit power to the other tire. So let's say instead of grass, what if that one tire is on ice, and that ice only has enough traction to transmit 10 torques to the ground? Since the right tire is only seeing 10 torques of resistance, we're only able to transmit 10 torques to the other tire. Our total will only be 20 torques and that's not enough to make the car move forward. The right tire will just continue to slip and you're not gonna get anywhere. The irony is, you're stuck even if technically your left tire has all the grip to move the car forward. But because of the differential, all the power is being sent to the tire with less traction, and since there's no resistance to bind the differential, even if you do have the grip on the other tire, you won't be able to move forward. Power is wasted going to the path of least resistance. So how do we get around this? Well, there are these things called limited slip differentials. As the name suggests, it limits the slip of the differential. Now there are many types of limited slip differentials of which we will not discuss in this video but we will in future videos. So again, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it. But as a sneak peek to that, I'll show you a modern iteration of a limited slip differential to get out of that icy situation that we had earlier. Nowadays, it's commonly called an electronic limited slip differential. Electronic being a computer's the one actually actuating it instead of like a mechanical device inside the differential to limit the differential. Again, this all sounds confusing, but let's go back to our example so we can digest it easier. So over here, the rollers on the right are actually locked. They're not free spinning to simulate grip, and the rollers on the left are free to spin to simulate ice. As you can see, we are stuck because the right tire isn't experiencing any resistance to force the differential to send power to the other wheel. So what if we're able to introduce some resistance to this axle, then we should be able to send more power to the left tire, right? So, so how can we do this? Believe it or not, there's already a mechanism in your car on each of your axles that can actually provide resistance. And that's the brakes. On more modern cars, a computer can actually send brake pressure to one tire at a time. So in this case, in theory, right, if we activate the right brakes, that should introduce some resistance to that axle binding the differential to send power 
to the left. So let's give it a try. Let's do that. So here we're activating the right brakes in three, two, one. And just like that, we have limited the slip of the differential, allowing the tire with traction to actually get the power we need to go forward. And there you have it. We're finally done explaining on how we convert dead dinosaur juice into proper forward propulsion. Woo! Yeah, baby! We can now finally move on to more advanced topics. So again, don't forget to comment down below on what you guys want me to explain in the future. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Or you can go to my streams and we can you can chat while, while driving or playing other video games. Ciao. Well, the camera follows me, so no matter where I walk, you know, I'll just be in the same spot because I don't have a cameraman, you know. It's just...